So today we are going to be studying our epic scriptures for this week are from the book of James. And James is one of my favorite books in the Bible. I put it out there. I don't know if y'all were just trying to be nice to me, but like 80% of the people were saying they like James as one of their favorite books. Anybody like the book of James in the Bible? Some of you are like, who's that James dude? Would you tell me a little bit more about him? I'll tell you just a little bit more about him. Why did I start to get an affinity towards the book of James? Um, it actually has to do with my sobriety. So when I went into a treatment center, Center some 22 years ago, um, they had these books that are no longer in print. Um, they were called the Serenity Bible. And I have a nice New Testament. It's actually sitting on my desk. I should have brought that out here. I have a New Testament with Psalms and Proverbs that is a Serenity Bible based. And what they did is they tied a bunch of the different scriptures to different steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So it had great meaning to me uh, when I was at that particular stage. And I began to do more and more research uh, some point about five years ago, I was asked to do a one-year big book study as, as the pseudonym for the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I did a one-year Bible study, so to speak, on the big book at the Orange Park Room of AA. And I started diving really deep into it, and I got blessed. They had just put out in print the original manuscript that you could buy a copy of, of the original big book of AA. And then I started reading more and more about the origins of it. And as it turns out, much of it was actually founded from the book of James. They wrote it. There was a group called the Oxford Group that was a Christian group at heart that was the group that kind of preceded Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, they made some concessions when they had 100 people. They called it the Group of 100, where they removed Jesus from it and it became the God of your own understanding. But for me, in my house, we will serve the Lord, right? So there is a little bit of strangeness at times that happens in those circles. But man, if you are having any problems with addiction or you have a family member, that is, I would have no problem whatsoever with you sending them to AA. If they are a Christian on top of it, come on, Jesus. They have even more of a chance of getting sober. I'm telling you, I was in a treatment facility with 52 people. There was only two people that I know of that are still sober today. Both of us are Bible-believing Christians that love God with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind. We're dealing with an addiction epidemic in our nation right now. It's an epidemic and people are dying all around us. Man, we need to go to any length to demonstrate the love of Christ to them with the hope that their lives would be transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. So this book of James, um, it's a book about activating our faith. One of the main sayings in it is don't just be hearers of the word, be doers of the word. Put your faith into action. James is the brother of Jesus, and he's written this book to encourage believers to live bold Christian lives. Let us pray and dive into the book of James. Lord, we thank you and praise you. What a weighty time of worship. I just sensed your presence in here, Lord. I have no doubt your desire is to touch each of us that we might see what you want us to see, hear what you want us to hear, and in the spirit of James, that we would be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. So, Lord, would you empower us by the Holy Spirit? Your word says that you are the paraclete, the one who comes alongside, our teacher, our guide, the very one who inspired the book of James. Holy Spirit, would you you inhabit the praises of your people this morning? Would you touch us? Would you change us? Would you use the word of God and ignite it in our hearts that it would bring life and hope this morning to those who are hurting? Father, we can't thank you enough for your presence today. Do what you will in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. We're going to open right up in James chapter 1, starting in verse 1. So if you have your Bibles with you today, turn with me. If you don't, shame on you. No, I'm teasing. Um, you might have them on your app or you could watch on the screen. But I do encourage you to bring them with you. Sometimes that old school Bible is just the way to go. James 1.1. 1, 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and steadfastness is its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. So he gives us a truth that is pretty plain for all of us to see. If you've lived any time in this world, you will know this to be true. You don't want to hear it. You don't use it as your bumper sticker, but it says, in this life, you will have trouble. I see a lot of heads shaking. Some of y'all experience that in your life, right? In this life, you're going to have trouble. 
He's telling us, get used to it, get ready for it. He's putting a vent on it that part of their trouble is coming from their faith, but the Jews who were in dispersion, as it said, there was a great time of stress on the church, a great time of stress on the Jewish people, and he's telling us in the midst of this that you can have joy in your troubles. Why are you all so quiet, right? You can have joy. It sounds crazy to think about. But God can do something different in the lives of believers where we can have joy in the midst of some of the most difficult circumstances in life. So I have found that truth to be constant, that in this life you'll have trouble. It seems like you get through one thing and you have a mountaintop experience and then all of a sudden there's trouble around the corner, right? So what should we do? We should come to expect it, right? We should come to know that, hey, the devil's going to try to put some landmines in our path that are going to try to keep us off our track. But if we know this is the case, then guess what? We could be prepared for it. We could be ready to overcome in the midst of it. Can I get an amen? amen? I can go back to my addiction. The time was 1996. Seemingly the worst time in my life. No doubt, I was about to lose my family. We were broke. I was busted. I wasn't repentant initially. I got busted doing drugs. So I wasn't all that happy about it. I wanted to continue to use. I was given very little alternatives other than going into an addiction treatment facility, which thank God I chose to go into at that time because God was working on my heart and I was at one of the lowest places in my life. And when I got there, there, I started to read some things that talked about the fact that one day you won't regret the fact that you're an addict. I was like, how is that possible? It brought nothing to me but pain, nothing to me but horror, almost cost me my marriage, cost me so much in my life. I did so many dumb things. It took me a long time. This is how dumb your pastor was. It took me so long to figure out that the only time I ever got arrested, I was drunk or high. Come on, Jesus. If I don't get drunk or high, guess what? I don't get arrested. Hallelujah, right? I mean, these were some kind of crazy revelations at that particular stage of my life, right, that I don't want to go back to. But miracles began to happen as I began to get sober, as I began to read the Word of God and open up that serenity Bible, and I was there looking at it, and I was learning about this sin slash disease that I had that was in control of my life. But I got hope from the words of James and from the other sections of Scripture that gave me hope that I didn't have to live that way any longer. And all of a sudden, day by day, little by little, things began to change. And it didn't happen overnight. For those of you who are trapped in any kind of sin, if you're trying to come out of that, say it's a spousal relationship and you've had some issues and challenges in your relationship because of whatever sin you're involved in, don't think that it's going to be all fixed in one day. It's not going to happen. It took me many years to get to the place where it was that damage. It was going to take some time for things to be made right. But thankfully, God had planted something in Mary Jo's heart where she loved him and she loved me with all her heart. And she stuck with me and she was there by me and she helped me in the midst of those difficult times in my life. Amen. Give her, you know, 30 plus years of marriage. Thank God. But what I learned is through that, God began to shape my story, and it made me the person that I am today. Do I still have issues? All kinds of them. Ask Mary Jo, right? I have all kinds of them. I have tons of issues still. But man, I am a lot different than I was back then. I'm still a work in progress. I'm striving to be all that I could be for my God because I love him, not because I'm trying to be obedient to the law, but because I love him. And out of that overflow of my love for God because he first loved me, I want to do the right thing today. I don't want to go back to those things. I don't want to live that way any longer. And God used my story over and over again to help inspire other people. And it doesn't just have to be through chemical addiction. God will use whatever troubles and trials you have in your life and help you overcome them. And at first, they will seem like some of the worst things in your life. And before you know it, that test will become part of your testimony. And God will use that to help make a difference in the lives of others. Would you get ready to have that happen in your life? life as well. Let me give you a different example, but in the same genre. This week, I heard of two people that lost their jobs by layoff. You know, at first you might think, man, you know, if you're an unbeliever and you get laid off, it might be like one of the worst days in your life. 
Many of us in this room have experienced that at some point in our life, and it seems like a very difficult thing. At first, I laughed because um, Pastor Brinson started posting things about promotion online. And I'm like, you know what? He actually gets it right. He didn't lose his job, but his wife did. He'll, he'll tell you. It was something that was publicly out there. It's not a secret. Um, you know, but there's layoffs in various areas, and we experience those different things from time to time, right? So as a believer, what if you said, in this life, we will have trouble, but I trust in my God, who is my employer, and maybe he's got a better job for you right around the corner. And if you're living according to financial peace, like we've been preaching around here a whole lot, that is an opportunity for promotion and not an opportunity to fear. Maybe God wanted you out of that situation, right? Maybe he's positioning you for the next thing in your life. He's getting you ready for where he wants to take you. And sometimes it doesn't come wrapped in a pretty Christmas basket. Sometimes it comes wrapped in all kinds of trouble. But God loves you and he works out all things for the good of those whom he loves for his glory, right? God is a good God, but sometimes it comes through these difficult circumstances and then God turns them around. In 2007, in the very early part of 2007, you know, I, I, I was what I perceived to be fairly unjustly let go of a job. And uh, it, it, at first I was angry about it. At first I was upset about it. I had no intention of leaving that place where I was working. I had, you know, everything seemed to be going in the right track. I loved what I was doing. But sometimes God will use those difficult circumstances because we're knuckleheads and we would never leave. Right? So he has to kick us in such a way that seems very difficult, but then all of a sudden you look back a couple years later and you're like, oh, that's why God did it. I never would have left. And he wanted to do something different with my life. So I say these things because one, James tells us in this life, you will have trouble. So come to expect that there's going to be challenges from time to time. And then you got to discern scripturally and spiritually, is it an attack from the devil? Is it a dumb thing that I did? Or is it God trying to move in some way in my life? And the ways that you begin to discern that is by spending time with God. We're going to talk a whole bunch about that during the month of January as we enter into a season of prayer and fasting. But sometimes God allows difficult things to happen to ruffle us up because if not, we would never move on to the next thing. Can I get an amen? Amen and amen. Furthermore, it might seem confusing, or if you want to ensure that you are in God's will, watch what James says next, James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave in the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. So I would ask you, are you inviting God into your decisions? Everybody's really quiet today. (laughs) Like, are you? You know, God wants to be in your decisions, both big and small. It doesn't have to be just the big things. Man, he wants that daily conversation with you. Remember how he walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the garden? They just hung out with them. They were sharing their stories. He wants to know about your day. He wants to be invited into your decisions, both large or small. He cares about you. He wants to be in a relationship with you, right? He wants to spend time with you. How amazing is that? The God of the universe wants to be in on the things that are running through your mind and the decisions that you're about to make. And if you would offer him up more decisions, how much better would your decision making be? Whenever I go out on my own and I try to force things and do it under my own agenda is when I tend to get myself into some kind of trouble. Maybe some of you can relate, right? And then how do we react when we see other people's dreams come true or not, right? I have a friend that recently got his dream car. How many of y'all have a dream car? This is usually a guy thing, but there's some ladies that have a dream car, right? Get, got, you're allowed to have a dream car. It's cool, right? So my friend um, was contemplating a lot. He's, he's a person who loves God. He wants to do the right thing. This car that he wanted was a significant amount of money, but I know this fellow to be one of the most generous guys that I've ever met in my entire life. He gives generously all the time. He is an amazing man of God that seeks to do the will of God and things of God. And he's like, you know, I said, you know, there's nothing wrong with the fact that God might give you this thing and allow you to do it. He's positioned you this way. I know your heart. He's like, Eric, I'm afraid this thing will be an idol for me. You know, okay, yeah, if it's an idol, you don't want to go there, right? But maybe God's blessing you in that. 
So he got his car. Now, I haven't got my dream car just yet. God's going to deliver it one day, right? Now, I could either be angry at him for getting his dream car, or I could rejoice with him, right? And man, when I saw that car, I had the pleasure of being there shortly after that car got delivered and saw the look on his face. And man, he was just lit up. He went about it in the right way. He didn't go into debt to get it. He prayed and asked God about it. See, sometimes we do the opposite. Maybe I would get ahead of myself and say, oh, he got that dream car. I'm jealous. I want to go get that dream car. So I go out there and finance that dream car, right? And I get in there and that new car smell starts to hit. And it smells so good just that first, right? But it shortly thereafter turns toxic because there's payment after payment after payment after payment after payment that will come. Some of you could relate, right? You're driving that car and it's got those payments and you wish you didn't have any more, right? So these are the kind of things that he's telling us very practically through God's word. And James, like, invite God into your decisions. It seems so basic, but why do we so often forget to do just that? God loves you that much. He wants to be in your decisions, and he wants to protect you from potential bad ones as well, right? How many bad decisions might we avoid if we invited God into our decision-making process? How many selected a spouse out of lust and got burned? How many bought, got a job without asking God and ended up hating it? How many bought that car and they shouldn't have, ignoring the wisdom and counsel of others and God, and now they're suffering under the weight of that decision. We've all done these kinds of things, but James tells us, ask in faith, spend time with God. He will guide you. He will direct you. He will give you wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. James 1.19, as you jump down just a little bit. Know this, my beloved brothers, let each and every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and with meekness the implanted or rooted word which is able to save your souls. Man, if we could learn to control our tongues, how amazing would that be, right? Right? We have some sayings in here. Um, when we were kids and we lived in South Florida, they would say, Cállate la boca. Ah. Some of y'all Hispanics know what that means, right? In English, that means shut up, shut your mouth, right? <laughs> and AA, since I'm sticking with recovery circles, they would say, take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. I'm pretty bad at this at times. I have to discipline myself because when I'm hearing a conversation, my mind tends to go very fast and I'm all about getting the answers out really quick. I'm all about responding. I'm all about giving the, the retort of whatever the issue might be. But sometimes we just need to listen. He says we need to listen a whole lot more than we speak. How much more wisdom would we garner? How much trouble would we save ourselves from? And he says with our mouths and our tongues, we need to get in control. And our generation, we need to get our keyboards under control too, right? On our phones too, right? We need to watch what we're saying. Lord, help us. All of these things really matter. Two words really stand out. He says implanted word, rooted word. Man, if you are here and you are just bouncing from church to church, or you're barely reading the word of God, or you're barely fellowshipping with other believers, that's not God's best plan for your life. Maybe you're already growing some, but if you really want to grow, you need to plant and dig deep roots. You know, we were getting ready for some people to come over to our house on Thanksgiving, and I got a little glimpse of this. Mary Jo bought two evergreen trees that go out by the doors when you come in, like Christmas tree looking type of things, right? So she went out and she took the dirt, she planted it in there and pushed it down, and tree number one was doing exceedingly well. It's green, it looks awesome. The tree number two, ask her if I'm telling a lie or not, she didn't have enough dirt, like we didn't get enough dirt with it, so it started leaning over and it was kind of falling out of the pot, then it wasn't right, it wasn't planted, it wasn't rooted, it wasn't deep, and then from the top down, it started to turn brown. It didn't take but a week. Think about that as an analogy for our own lives. If you're out there surfacy all the time and you're not plugging in and you're not getting rooted, 
man, you are going to be turning brown. You're going to be wilting when those difficult times come and those challenges come. Who's going to be around there for you to help you out? Who's going to be there alongside of you? How are you going to have the root word of God deeply rooted in your heart that when trouble comes, joy is going to come out instead of fear? He's giving us great wisdom here. He's saying, get rooted, get plugged in. I am so glad to see you here. As Brinson said earlier, one of the statistics that we've noticed is the December 6th weekend or the weekend immediately following Thanksgiving is one of the lowest attended church days ever. And then giving days, usually it is absolutely abysmal because why? You want to be gut level honest? We function in the ways of the world. We go out there and spend all our money on Thanksgiving, on Cyber Monday, on Black Friday, and then we come in here this week and we're broke. Y'all are still being real quiet. I hope y'all didn't do that this week, right? But that's the reality of it, right? We don't abide in God's word. We go out there and we make the decisions on our own and we don't plan for it because it should be zero difference. If you're living in accordance with God's word, your giving should be unchanged. Your, your fear level should be unchanged. Your debt level should be unchanged. You shouldn't fear coming and giving an offering the week after because you blew a whole lot more money than you should have the week before, right? So being the fact that you're even here today is awesome. God is moving. He wants to speak to you today. He planted it on your heart to be here this morning, to hear this message, to enjoy this worship, to fellowship with other believers. Man, my, I just pray you will continue to plug in and watch what God does in your life. See, we all know what the word says, but James gets to the core of the matter in James 1.22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away, and at once he forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perceives, being no hearer who forgets, but is a doer, one who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. People who know a whole lot about the Bible and don't do stuff are some of the most miserable people I have ever met. I am dead serious. It happens that way. This is a book not to just be consumed for knowledge's sake. It's meant to implore us to action, to go out there and live out our faith. That's where the rubber meets the road. But as Christians, how many of us at times choose to blot out certain parts of the Bible that we don't like for whatever reason it is? I remember when I was young and I was going to church and one pastor came in and he preached a message that stuck with me ever since. And he talked about the Bible being a lot like a suit. And he says, what happens in life is most of us, we go out there and we tailor that suit to fit us in our wants and our understanding and our needs. And he says, the Bible's not like that at all. You need to conform to get into that Bible, right? You need to conform to fit into that suit. Now, some of us, we do that when a big day is around the corner, do we not? Like when it was my daughter's wedding, I lost like 20 pounds right off the bat. Now I'm still struck. Nobody's with me. You do that for those big days. Like, so, so I was conforming. I intentionally bought that pair of pants that was one size smaller than I currently was. And we lived in fear. Like two weeks before, I'm out there. I'm going to buy another one just in case, just in case I don't hit that goal and it don't fit, right? Thankfully, I got to go back to J.C. Penney's and they returned the bigger one, right? Now I wish I had it because I don't fit into the other one right now, you know, but um, we do stuff like that, right? We, we need to be tailored to fit what the word says. It's not the other way around. So we take issues. I bring up money a lot because I think it is the one largest competitor with our heart for worship. Tithe, that one can't be true. There's just no way. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a marker to that one and blot it out. Not in yellow highlighter, but I'll take the black pen to that particular one. Husband of one wife, not so much, right? Sex before marriage, that can't possibly be true. It feels so good. You mean I'm not supposed to live with somebody else? Let's just get everybody mad here. Come on, Jesus. Let's just get everybody <laughs> mad here today. You mean I'm not supposed to live with somebody else before I'm married? No, you're not. Why? God, I don't completely understand all of God's reasons, but I trust him. I love him. I believe in him. I know his plans are better than my plans. But no, we could go violate that. Well, no, that's not what it says. You know, we can conform to it. I mean, the big issue today I saw all over Facebook was um, 
the Lauren Daigle, I guess, commented on homosexuality on there and did not come out straight up and say that it was against God's word. She's, you know, I guess, dealing with that issue mentally of where she wants to be on that particular position. And I saw a ton of people roasting her. You know, I'm definitely a conservative in those kinds of areas, but I believe we're all born in sin. We all got issues. We all have challenges and God loves us and he works through us. And I'm not going to tend on the legalistic side of things. I believe God's word to be true. And I think we need to stand on that, but we need to do so in a very loving way, right? We need to do so not in an accepting or condoning way, but we need to be doing it in a loving way. It says, be angry and sin not. Don't covet thy neighbor's stuff. That car was really awesome. I mean, like, I just, like, I just don't want that payment. Scripture says that we'll be blessed in the doing of God's word. Would you yourself right now resolve yourself to take God's word seriously, not live on the surface, to dive into it, to learn it, to grow in it, to let it transform your thoughts, your minds, and ultimately your actions, and watch the blessings that will be coming. Do you want to be blessed? Then put God's word into action. Amen. Just a couple more scriptures, and then I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. James 1, 26. If anyone thinks he is righteous and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. True religion is not a brand of jeans, right? True religion is described here. He says that we need to go out and make a difference. And Christmas time gives us a wonderful opportunity to do that. Between Thanksgiving and Christmas, we always do things corporately like we've been doing. But what if you were to just find one or two people to go one-up that experience on, to just demonstrate tangibly the love of God to them throughout this season? Let them know how much God loves them, to do it with people that you normally wouldn't do it with. You know, one of the ministries that I'm most proud of here at Journey is our jail ministry. We don't get any real fruit from it coming back of people coming directly into our congregation. It's a group of very sacrificial people that go out there and they package up 300 plus things for each of the inmates to have for Thanksgiving, 300 plus gift baskets for the inmates to have at Christmas time. Also for every single one of the people that's working in the jail, they go and they do that over and above. Do you know they go out there and they do seven services each, both on Thanksgiving and on Christmas day, giving of their Thanksgiving and their Christmas day. That's an amazing thing. Month in, month out, they're going in there and preaching. If you're looking for a great ministry to get involved with, I will definitely prop them up. Man, they do some great things. That's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. There's other groups like Journey Out. They go out to the Clara White Mission. There's other groups that go to the Salvation Army. You don't have to do it just at Christmas time. Guess what? At Christmas time, they're packed. They need you there in March. They need you there in May. They need you there in July, right? demonstrating the love of God in real and tangible ways to a lost and hurting community that surrounds us. There's so many that are hurting. Can you sense it? There's so many that are hurting. Maybe even many of you who are in this very room right now, you're hurting. You're in need of a touch from God. Where does it start? How do we change? James 2.14, he gets to the heart of the matter. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? That fit, can that faith save them? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warm and filled without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith, if it does not have works, is dead. But some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one and you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Amen. So plug in, serve, make a difference with your life. Here's how I want to close. I just sense that there's a little bit of a heavy spirit, even from the time that we were in worship, that people are dealing with stuff. So I think it's very appropriate that we find ourselves in James. These are my last scriptures that I'm going to read. And then I'm going to invite you up here to fill the altars during our last song to be prayed for. James 5.13 says this, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. 
Maybe during this next song, you'll do both. I remember the first prayer I ever prayed uh, as a believer was not for myself. My grandmother was sick. And there were people up here at the altar, as there will be today. There'll be some people up here who would love to join hands with you and pray with you over a situation that might be going on in your own life. Or maybe there's someone that you love that you're praying for and you'd like to mix your faith with somebody else and believe God for whatever that circumstance or situation is. Man, we'd love to join hands with you and pray. It goes on to say in James 5, 14, is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he too will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray with one another that you might be healed, that the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. You might be there saying, Eric, I've been praying over this situation over and over and over again, and it hasn't changed. I wanna encourage you to keep praying over and over and over again. My last analogy to my addiction, see, when people looked at me on the outside and saw the way that I was behaving and the way that I I was living, they might've said, that man is no Christian at all. Look at him, he's out there drinking, he's out there doing drugs. What they didn't know was every night I would lay my head down and I would say, Lord, let me not do this again tomorrow. Lord, I don't want to do this. I want to live for you, I, I need help here. And that sadly went on for probably two and a half years where I would say that prayer and I'd wake up the next morning and I'd do the same thing. Yes, I was discouraged. Yes, it seemed like it was taking longer than it should have. God has different ways than we have. But that one day I went to bed and I laid my head down and I said, Lord, I don't want to get up and do that same thing tomorrow. Just like that story read, he came through in my life and he removed every obsession that I had to use, every obsession that I had to drink. And from that day forward, from July 23rd of 1996, I've never felt compelled to do that again. Whatever your situation is, it doesn't have to be addiction. Could be sickness, it could be anger, it could be any other sin that you might be dealing with, any other pain that you might be going through, it could be a relational issue, you name it, God wants to hear things both big and small. Nothing's too small. Man, I would love to join hands with you and pray with you, as will some of our other leaders. If you guys can begin to make your way up to the front, I see Don, other elders who might be here, Steph, Mary Jo. We'll be up here at the front and there's nothing that needs to be embarrassing about this at all. Maybe you've never come to the altar before. I don't want you to be embarrassed about that. I'm not gonna turn my microphone on so that everybody could hear, I promise you. Nobody's gonna reshare anything that you might share with them. What they wanna do is pray for you and activate our faith together and see this come to pass. And what we're going to do is we're going to worship together in song. So if you feel led, you're welcome to come on up. If you want to lean down by yourself, you're welcome to. But today I would encourage you to join hands with somebody. Even if it makes a little bit of a line, that's okay. We would love to join hands with you and pray. If you'd like to take communion by yourself or with your family, there's communion elements both to my left and my right. Reflect on what God has said to you through the word. Let it take root in your life today. Don't leave here the same way that you walked in this morning. Would you rise with me? Let's worship our God and King. I'll end up closing after the song in prayer. But if you need prayer, come on up here to the front. To every path, to every heart parade, to every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. Oh, and you are my portion. Are my hiding place a home? I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. Yeah, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life.
I would ask you with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, you know, maybe you wouldn't call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, but today you feel him tugging at your heart. You have this desire that's coming from within you to just surrender your life to him. You may be a believer, you're already saved, but you've been going through some struggles and today's a day you know that you need to rededicate your life to him. If that's you, I would love to pray for you before you go. So would you do me a favor? If that's you, would you raise your hand up real high right where you're at and I'll pray for you. I see your hand, sir, thank you. Is there anyone else today? It's a little dark out there, I can't see. I see your hand there, ma'am, thank you, Lord. I see your hand over on the side, sir. Thank you, Lord. Keep moving. I see your hand right there. Thank you, Lord. If you raised your hand, I want to encourage you before you leave to come up here to the front. Myself, others will be up here. We'd love to give you some information and help you start off some next steps in your relationship with Christ to help just cement it in, help take it to the next level. So, Father, we come before you today at the close of this service, and our hearts have been warmed by what we've read in the book of James. What a sweet and precious time we had worshiping you in song. I thank you for the impact that you've had on my heart as I was studying it, as I was preaching it. Lord, I feel I've drawn closer to you, and I pray today that people have done the same. That today's message reminded them of your goodness even in the midst of trouble. When the challenges come, you are still there. You've never left us. You've never forsaken us. You care for us. You're there to guide us and walk us through the struggle. And Lord, we can't thank you enough for that. So Father, we pray for those in our lives or even for ourselves. If we're the ones that are struggling, Lord, we pray for a breakthrough right now in the name of Jesus. Devil, you have no stay and no say in what's going on here right now. Lord, we pray for an absolute breakthrough in the lives of everybody who is here today in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus. Lord, we are so thankful for those who have raised their hand today, and we join with them as a sign of fellowship, as a sign of brotherhood and sisterhood and saying that, Jesus, you truly are the Son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. Lord, from this day forward, we will serve you and live for you every single day of our life, not so that we could avoid sin or so that we could avoid hell. You already won us the victory on Calvary's cross. Your blood is brought us forgiveness and we can't thank you enough for it. The reason we want to serve you is because we love you, oh God. We love you with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind. Father, we thank you for those who raised their hand. And again, before you go, come on up and say hello. We'd love to help you with some next steps. For the rest of us, man, go and live like Jesus. Ladies, I hope you're here on Friday night. Guys, join me on Friday. Couples, come out on Saturday. Let's make a difference in our community. If you're new to the church, come on up and say hello. I'd love to meet you. God bless you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.